Welcome to The Way Podcast on FM 91.7, WHUS Stores at the top of the hour. I'm your host, Bill Trufesky, and for more, be sure to go to podcasttheway.com, follow on Twitter, Instagram, all of that. My guest today is Danny Gold from the Underworld Podcast and a few other projects. How are you doing today, Danny? I'm doing really well. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming out to the show. And what are some of those other projects before we get into it? Oh, man. Uh, so <laughs> I am. Yeah, there's a few. I'm a reporter and, and journalist and documentary filmmaker. Um, you know, I, I focus specifically usually on crime, well, specifically and usually uh, on crime and politics and conflicts. Uh, I've done a bunch of reporting overseas. I was one of the first people at Vice News uh, and I produced documentaries there and was an on, on air correspondent. Done a bunch of stuff for PBS NewsHour. And I've written some long form stuff for places like Wired and Sports Illustrated. Recently, I've, I've done a lot more in terms of this podcast and a couple, you know, short documentaries, some stuff in El Salvador, uh, some stuff in St. Louis, and, you know, just basically out here in the journalism world trying to survive. Sounds good. And yeah, you're a very journalist based podcast where you talk about on, like the underworld, like a lot of like Central America, Southern America. Stuff like that. Yeah, uh, just organized crime in general. You know, I, um, I I I was seeing all these people that are interested in in true crime, and I think that's that's kind of oversaturated. You know, you have Johnny Trailer Park kills his wife, and to, so he can date her sister, and the bumbling sheriff messes up the DNA, and that's great. People seem very interested in that, but there was a, a big space I think in transnational organized crime, whether it's mafia stuff or cartel stuff, um, or even high level financial scams. And I, I find that stuff fascinating. I think a lot of people do if you look at movies and, and, and documentary series and things like that, and there was really just no market for it. And I've got a lot of experience covering it, as does my co-host, uh, Sean Williams, who's written some fantastic stories about you know Indian mafia dons and the Berlin criminal underworld and, and meth labs in Burma. So we decided that, that we would uh, launch this podcast together, and every week we switch off, sort of taking the listener on a journey into some of these groups or personalities. Sometimes you mix in some good historical stuff. Uh, and it's, it's, I mean, it's fun to do, you know, and people seem to really be enjoying it. Sounds good. And yeah, people enjoying it. My, uh, I did an episode on following Aquilo in Colombia, my most popular episode. And hopefully this follows up with that. And speaking yeah, of, I hope, so. I hope so. And what we're talking about today, MS-13, the street gang out in El Salvador. So yeah, what is uh, the MS-13 street gang? So MS-13 is this extremely powerful street gang that has gotten a lot of attention, I'd say, over the past decade. I think it starts with this National Geographic documentary about them, calling, calling them the most dangerous gang in the world. And they really, you know, they have these giant face tattoos, and they're infamous for using machetes and all that. And they really latched on to the, um, the popular imagination, I think, of, of this country especially. And then when Donald Trump took office, he really made MS-13 in the U.S. a focus, uh, even though a lot of people will tell you, you know, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to beat around the bush. Like they are a very dangerous gang when it comes down to crime and, and murders and things like that. They really don't uh, hit the zenith of stuff that you see the cartels doing in Mexico or anything like that. So they're this gang that's, you know, in El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, parts of Mexico and parts of the U.S. like Los Angeles, the su suburbs in Virginia around D.C., Long Island that just have this sort of uh, infamous reputation for being extremely violent, uh, for, for looking a certain way. And yeah, they just really hold the popular attention and people are fascinated by what they do. And they actually started in Los Angeles before they moved on to El Salvador. We can get into that a little bit later. Sounds good, yeah. Like I've heard of them here and there, but then with this podcast, I started doing research. And even yesterday, I'm watching the No Jumper podcast. It's a very casual one. And a Crip member is one of the people doing the interview with the host and yeah like they just bring up ms-13 out of the blue so they're talking about seeing like their stickers or their uh the ms-13 written at skate parks stuff like that but so yeah first how did they um come to america you said they started in los angeles so they actually started in los angeles in the uh in starting in like the late 70s uh early 1980s el salvador was undergoing a brutal civil war and you had the sort of right-wing oligarchy-backed government 
fighting a leftist guerrilla conglomeration and, and you know one of these cold war conflicts that that was especially brutal and it, it you know it destroyed the country the u.s when, was actually when was backing, this? like what year uh, i believe it kicked off in 1979 or 1980 and it lasted for a little more than a decade you had the u.s actually backing the government there um and supporting some of these these you know for lack of a better word death squads that were targeting the population you had war crimes on all sides even though the right wing side was was especially brutal and during that time period you had a lot of salvadorans fleeing as refugees and many of them ended up in los angeles and they ended up in, in neighborhoods in los angeles that were not not great neighborhoods right they were these were already gang infested neighborhoods la in the 80s was just like a gang haven you know uh bloods crips all sorts of mexican and, and mexican american gangs it was it was a really brutal atmosphere so these salvadorans would often fall prey to these gangs and they wanted some protection as their you know for themselves so ms-13 actually started as a group of kids in I, I believe it was like the late 70s early 80s that were really just stoners you know skateboarders they listened to heavy metal they had ripped jeans and long hair and they were called the mara salvatruta stoners at first so they were not this fearsome street gang that you, you've heard of but this influx of refugees and this influx of Salvadorans, uh, the gang started to grow and it served as this protection for Salvadoran immigrants, refugees that were being preyed upon by Mexican gangs, by black gangs that really had no one who had their back. There's another gang that, you know, MS-13 has this three, four decade long war going on with called 18th Street. And 18th Street had started a bit earlier. They were just, you know, your average sort of street gang in Los Angeles. Uh, they were actually a mixed gang. A lot of a lot of different Latino, Latino ethnicity gang members, uh, Mexican, Salvadoran, Guatemalan, Honduran, even some Romanians from what I've heard, they sort of morphed as well into a mainly Salvadoran gang. And these gangs just both grew phenomenon, like at a phenomenal level in the 80s and started morphing into this more powerful, more aggressive, and much more violent gang. I heard like 18th Street and, uh, yeah, like they're very like, almost progressive like they didn't care who was who would join like they'd take anyone right yeah yeah i mean that's a joke that we kind of made that they were they were inclusive um but yeah you know these these gangs were neighborhood gangs when they started off and they 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 were formed as you know a lot of street gangs form a lot of organized crime groups form as protection in marginalized communities in bad neighborhoods and i'm not saying they form from for for honorable reasons right you know these these were violent gangs they they were dealing drugs. They were fights, all stuff like that. But they were they did not form as this like brutally murderous, uh, callous gang at first. They they formed as like a normal street gang, and they just started growing exponentially as more refugees from El Salvador poured into the country, and as the gang wars in Los Angeles ramped up, and you know they they wanted to expand and they wanted to make money, and um, that on that level of street gang. You know, that involves an increase in violence, an increase in membership, and an increase in doing illegal activities. A lot of people left El Salvador. Was it 25% like because of the Civil War? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, a quarter of the country. And it's not a big country. I think right now the population is around 6 million or so. Um, but a that's quarter, like 1. yeah. 1.5 million, I'd say. Well, that's now. So first it's like 30, 40 years ago. But yeah. Yeah. I, I it was I'm probably around that. You know, I don't have the exact numbers. But yeah, a lot of them fled. Um, you know, there's already there was already an established Salvadoran community in Los Angeles. Of course, there was a lot more opportunity in America in the 80s than any of El Salvador's neighbors, than Mexico and and immigration. You know, it was an issue back then, but it wasn't as as aggressively policed as it is right now. So Los Angeles was an easy area for them to go to. There were jobs there, and uh, and that's what happens. How big were they compared to like the Crips or the Bloods? Were they ever on the same level or even exceed it? I mean, in the eighties, no, not at all. You know, they 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 started off as these like small, you know, and then what happened was cliques would start forming, right? So different areas, different expansions, and all that, and they would really uh, they started to grow, but they were nowhere near this this national level of the Crips and the Bloods. I don't think they're anywhere near that sort of level right now in the U.S. Obviously, in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, they are, and what happened in terms of their expansion was that, you know, in the early 90s, uh, new laws were passed in terms of uh, immigrants or, or, you know, people that were here that could be deported back to their countries if they committed a crime. And that, that was sort of expanded. So you had 
the a lot of these gangsters in the U.S. who at that time were gangsters, you know, in the '90s they were an established gang. They got deported back to El Salvador, and El Salvador in, in the '90s. And El Salvador in the '90s was a you know it was a destroyed country. Um, they did not have from strong the Civil state, War. From the Civil War, yeah, they didn't have strong state institutions. There wasn't strong law enforcement. There were still a lot of weapons on the ground. Um, they just weren't ready for this influx of hardened gangsters from the U.S. to come into that country. And as soon as those gangsters got there, you know, they started expanding. They started forming their own cliques in El Salvador and just growing and growing and growing. And that sort of set about this thing in the, in the country where they just, you know, started taking over neighborhoods, started expanding. And law enforcement there just didn't, didn't really have a grasp on what was going on and didn't know what to do. Is the reason we don't have such a problem today, in America at least, because a lot of them were exported back to El Salvador? But the consequences now El Salvador has to deal with this whole influx coming in. You know, I don't know whether it's it's whether or not we we don't have a problem because of that. I mean, that's that's definitely one of the reasons. I think law enforcement here in general is just better at shutting these things down. MS-13 and 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 18th Street, they're not they're not what you would call organized crime in a way. You know, they're very sloppy. They they don't do things like the mafia. You know, they're not they're not smart about what they do. They commit these brutal crimes. They get a lot of attention, and they, they make it pretty easy for law enforcement to crack down on them. I mean, one of the reasons they were under the radar for so long was because, I guess this is a, could be considered one of the smart things they did. They're not preying on, you know, John Smith in the suburbs, right? They're preying on other immigrants from Central America, many of them who are undocumented, who law enforcement maybe doesn't have the best relationship with who these people are probably scared to go to law enforcement because they're undocumented. Um, so, so they were able to kind of go under the radar in that regard because they weren't this expensive gang that was targeting, um, you know, uh, normal, I want to say normal, that's the wrong word. Um, regular who were targeting regular. Well, they, these are regular Americans, but they weren't targeting, you know, they weren't targeting the suburbs. They weren't targeting the kind of people who are going to be loud about it. They weren't targeting, um, they weren't, yeah, they, they weren't targeting uh, white people. They weren't targeting these, these areas of middle class people. They were targeting poor Salvadoran immigrants who were being preyed upon, and they don't have a lot of recourse. And they're ignored, you know, by law enforcement to a degree. And, it, you know, they were caught between a really, really sort of callous system that overlooks them and these brutal street gangs. And there wasn't much that, that, there wasn't much that they could do. And that's what the Bloods or Crips or other gangs were doing? like uh, targeting uh, suburban areas or even the mafia? I, the, the mafia, you know, operates at a, at a, they have much more of a, of a known presence. The, the Crips and the Bloods as well, too. You know, they were, they were targeting, they, they were expanding much more rapidly than these gangs at first. Um, and they, they would target English-speaking people, right? Um, and people who are, who are, so, I mean, the Bloods and the Crips, obviously they prey in marginalized communities, most organized crime organizations do. But these were people who, have their own issues with law enforcement, but you know they're talking to reporters. They're making the news. They're um they're dealing with people who some people do do uh, approach law enforcement with that they do have a recourse. They don't have to fear being deported. They don't have to fear ICE. So it's uh it, it's a bit of a different situation. Okay, yeah, I can see that. How did the you said there was a rivalry between MS13 and 18th Street? How did that one begin? Like so shouldn't they all be like helping each other sort of and creating a bigger gang? That's what I would picture at least. Yeah, I mean, they, they have had truces in El Salvador at times and talk, talks about unity, but like I said, they're, they're unorganized, they're kind of sloppy, and they're, you know, they're violent more than anything else. Um, so there's a lot of debate over how this, this, this sort of giant... Is that what made them such... Sorry to interrupt, but is that what makes them such a hot news topic because they're so violent? They're, they're extremely violent, but I, I think it's a lot. You know, I, I think there's this sort of image that was captured by that these, these documentaries about the world's most dangerous gang and all that. I think the face tattoos and the, the sort of aura of, of, of viciousness and using machetes and all that um, really captures the popular imagination. And, and media in general has sort of run wild with them and, and, and what they've done. Uh, yeah, so I think, I think that's part of it. But the rivalry, there's a lot of debate about this. The, the story goes that they were sort of operating in the same areas so there was a little bit of tension. They were they were drawing from the same pool of recruits in Los Angeles, and they kind of functioned though they were kind of like cousins. You know, they weren't always beefing. There wasn't this crazy animosity between them. But then a fight broke out at a, at a house party. Some people say it was over a woman. Some people say it was over 
one gang member leaving one of the gangs to join the other that they were originally cool with, but then drinking started, tensions rose, there was a fight, someone got shot, and then you just had 30 years of war and like tens of thousands of people killed over it. But they became they became rivals right off the bat. And even now, you know, in El Salvador, it's, it's like kill the other members on site. And one of the gangs, 18th Street, actually broke into two factions, um, the revolutionaries and the southerners. So there's even fractions between those gangs. Um, but yeah, now there, it's, it's literally been 30 years of gang war across four or five countries now between the two of them over what people say was a fight at a house party. It's kind of like a smaller version of like World War One. Like it starts with one assassination, then everybody gets involved. Here, like two or three people argue, fight happens, and then everyone gets involved. Yeah, it's a crazy sort of butterfly effect story. I mean, this... If it is about a woman, you know, this woman is like the, the Helen of Troy of uh, <laughs> of Central American street gangs just causing this this dilemma where, where I mean, I'm, I'm laughing about it too, but it's also like... I mean, well, yeah, it's not so funny many too. People, right, so many people <laughs> yeah. have died because of this this tension. Plus, I guess, you know, even even without that, these are, these are gangs that are operating in the same areas, the same countries, the same neighborhoods. Eventually, they're going to come up against each other over money, over territory, and stuff like that. So I, I guess it was inevitable. Yeah. And like you said, with the tattoos, like everybody wears, uh, well, one of the things the media says, or one of the things I thought too, was they have a lot of those MS-13 tattoos all over their face, all over their arms. That's what helps makes them uh, distinct. That's what people picture. And I mean, well, tell me how true that is too. But then you also mentioned in the podcast that nowadays they wear a lot of like polos and a lot of like blue jeans, stuff like that. Yeah, it's part of their, their the way they've adapted. You know, yeah, the face tattoos were were a big thing, and there's still plenty of guys who have them, but they tend to be older gang members. And after a while, some of the gang leadership kind of smart enough, and they were like, "Look," and this is only in recent years. They were kind of just like, "Look, man, um, this is too obvious. Like, we want to be a little under the radar. Uh, putting uh, your gang tattooed on your face makes you a target for opposition. It makes you a target for law enforcement." And it makes it a lot harder for you to kind of walk around and, and blend in. So they kind of were like telling the younger members of the gang, like maybe don't tattoo your face. Maybe don't make it so obvious that you're a gangster. You don't have to dress in, in a certain way. Maybe try to look a little more presentable um, just in terms of, of staying off the radar of both law enforcement and opposition gangs. Yeah, law enforcement. Like what, what's the violence between cops and MS-13 like? I mean, I'm, I'm talking about specifically El Salvador because most of my research oh, okay. and reporting has taken 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 place there. Yeah, it, it is. Um, it's brutal in El Salvador. The war between police and the gangs there. Uh, you have a lot of targeted killings of gang members by police, who extrajudicial assassinations or killings, whatever you want to call them, executions. Um, you know, there's hundreds a year because. It actually has popular support in the country because people are so so tired of the gangs preying on them. But the gangs also target police as well. Most of the time, they're going to wait when they're till they're off duty. They're going to try to get them outside their homes because a lot of times they live in the same neighborhoods, and they'll target them then. When it comes up to actually going up to the to the police and having like running gang battles, those are a lot fewer because the gangs are out. You know, they're 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 out ammoed, out weapons, out classed by the police. You know, who have some pretty intense training, you know, they all, they have automatic or semi-automatic rifles. They are kitted out. You know, they, they, they operate like a military in a way the, 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 some of the more higher level Salvadoran police groups who they just, you know, the gangs can't compete. They don't have, some of them have the weaponry, but they don't have enough to really go toe to toe with the police to engage them on that level. So when the police go through these neighborhoods, when they're kitted out, the gangs are going to try to avoid them. But the gangs do kill police officers, and they target them when they're off duty. They target them at their homes. They target their family members. So it, it's especially brutal. And it's just to like kind of keep them out, like push the cops away. It's war. Just pure you know, war. It's, it's it's they're not gonna they're not gonna push them away in that regard. But it's just like it's revenge. It's to show them that like we're not gonna take this. Um, gang leadership sometimes will declare war on the police or on the country when they feel like. Uh, they're facing restrictions and restrictions that they're tired of. It's to kind of show show law enforcement they still have some power, but it, it's you know it's it's war. They're not gonna, you know, they they have their neighborhoods they control, and the police are gonna go through them um, when they're kitted out and armed up. But uh, they're never gonna force them out of the country. You know what I'm saying? But but they do wanna wanna make their presence known and make the police know that there'll be consequences sometimes for their actions. And the police have the same regards with the gang. You know they're gonna 
go into their home sometimes and execute them. And, and it's, uh, you know, there are also um, extrajudicial death squads that, that operate in El Salvador, a rumor to be made up of former law enforcement or current law enforcement and military that are just tired of the gangs operating in the way that they do. And they'll go out there and they'll, they'll kill them without trial, without anything like that. Jeez, what's the politics in this? I don't know. Is there like any, um, what are the laws like? What, uh, are they trying to crack down on this or anything? What uh, actions yeah. have they taken? I mean, they're, they've been trying to crack down on this for years. You know, they've had an iron fist policy. They've had an iron iron fist policy. They've had a super iron fist policy of really going after the gangs hard. Um, but it's a hard thing to stamp out. You know, they're so entwined now in the country that, and, and also when you do these sort of things where you really crack down, sometimes you create a lot of new gang members. Someone sees their brother harassed, young kids in, in, these, in these bad communities, in these bad communities, not bad communities, in these poor communities, in these marginalized communities, get harassed a lot by, by the police. They're a lot more likely to join up. So it's sort of a self-perpetuating cycle. Um, you know, in recent years, the government has decided to classify some of the gangs as terrorist organizations. So they can charge gang members with being belonging to a terrorist organization. So it's, it's brutal, and the gangs go back and forth. And now there's a, there's a thing where they really sort of you know, ensconce themselves not only in in the neighborhoods, but in sort of the political process in the country of controlling votes of things like that. So you have under the table deals sometimes now between politicians and gang leaders in terms of turning the vote out, in terms of keeping the peace. There have been truces that have been under the radar. It's a really it's a it's a it's a tough situation. I I don't claim to have an easy answer. Um, some people in the country want to see more truces between the gangs. They're like, we have to work with them. We have no choice. Others think this unfairly or stupidly legitimizes the gangs and their power when you deal with them on that sort of level. Yeah, and like we said before, like Los Angeles, America, they have like a somewhat presence, but in El Salvador, like you said, 6 million is their population, like the country itself. And I think yeah. I have a stat that says 60,000 active gang members and 500,000 yeah, that... people connected to the gang members. Yeah, yeah. So it's, 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 it's a huge number there. And I don't want to give the impression, too, that, you know, look, if you go down to El Salvador and you go to the beaches there and you go surfing and you're a tourist, you're not going to have a problem, right? I, these things happen in, in certain communities. Obviously, there's a lot of security in, in, in more middle class and upper class communities. You'll see people, you know, armed guards with shotguns outside banks and things like that. But I don't want to give the impression that you're going to go to the country and this is going to be a very noticeable thing, right? If you go to the the tourist areas and the surface communities, and you know, you're an American, you're not going to have a problem with El Salvador. Um, you've got to go looking for it. I mean, you're not going to have a problem in El Salvador. You're not going to have a problem with the gangs. Uh, it's not, you know, this isn't, this isn't like um, a war that you're going to visibly see. It's just, uh, unfortunately, it is, it is happening in, 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 in many neighborhoods in the, in the country, but I don't want to give the impression that you should be scared to go down there um, because it is a beautiful country and it is an amazing culture, and I don't want to I don't want to discourage people from going down there. Unfortunately, I cover the worst parts of that country and have to talk about it. And there's a lot of people in the country that are affected by what's going on. I understand that. That makes sense. I want to visit Europe. I want to visit visit Central America, Asia, Africa. Like I want to visit the world. Who doesn't? Yeah. And most yeah. of it's safe too. But like going to El Salvador, you mentioned in the podcast too. You said you were in like the bad territory, so maybe that's why. But you said you almost walked into, you almost like crossed an invisible line and almost got in trouble because of that, right? Yeah, yeah. We were, I mean, I was reporting, you know, and um, we were in a, a very, very uh, big stronghold for MS-13. And we had gotten permission to go there. You know, this is, this is, these aren't the kind of places you, go, you would go as a tourist. It's not like by the hotel or by the water. No, it's like, no, it's not even. Yeah, it's 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 in one of the one of the slums, for lack of a better word, um, and it's not a place that even you know a middle class person in El Salvador would, would would typically find themselves venturing into. And there was a health fair at the time there that one of the NGOs had set up with one of the churches. We had permission to be there, but we kind of strayed away from the area that um, that we were you know allowed to be in. And they sent some little kids up to us to kind of tell us that hey, don't go any further because there will be consequences. Um, I don't actually think anything bad would likely have happened to us. You know, no one wants, the gangs aren't stupid. They don't want the attention that comes with beating up a bunch of American journalists in their territory. But uh, it is something when you're going to these neighborhoods that you have to be conscious of that, you know, you are, you're a guest 
and uh, there are ways in, of doing things and there are proper procedures. I worry more about the Salvadorans that I work with when I'm down there of what could potentially happen to them if I get out of line. So that's that's where a lot of the, the concern comes from. But um, yeah, you do have to, you know, going into these neighborhoods, you need to essentially um, uh, get a level of permission uh, and, and reach out to the right people and get cleared to go into them. Otherwise, you shouldn't be going into them. I'm going to have to like ask good parts about El Salvador too, because obviously we're going to be talking about all the gang stuff, the bad parts. Mm. <laughs> One of the, um, well, I think it was the guardian. I saw a documentary, but there was a town. Wait, actually, I have a note over here. Distrito Italia, if I'm saying that right, but it's yeah. supposed to be a, yeah, is that an area where not even the government employees will enter because it's so bad. Yeah. I mean, there are neighborhoods like that where, they're not going to go in there on their own. The police can go in there. I don't want to make it seem like the police are, I mean, they'll go in there when they're, you know, ready to go. But yeah, what in the gang control neighborhoods, it's, um, you know, they don't want outsiders coming in. They don't, they don't trust outsiders. They don't trust people coming in. So it, it makes it very hard sometimes to, for them to get resources. So churches, NGOs, uh, government employees, they have a hard time getting in and the gangs, you know, they, they take this line. They'll complain that they're not getting any attention or any resources at the same time, they make it very hard for people like that to come in there and, and set up these things and, you know, do these sort of provide these sort of services that would benefit these communities. And it's kind of like, you know, you really can't have it both ways. Um, you can't complain that there's no resources in your community and that no one's paying any attention if you're also not going to let NGOs operate in there, um, you know, ban government government employees who are going to come in there and uh, and provide certain, certain – uh, services for your community and how much so like getting resources coming in and trying to improve the area what uh well what's the average person like in el salvador based on the economy like how many people live in poverty middle class or how many people are upper class but i feel like that's um, have a big input on these gangs yeah i mean i don't i don't have the numbers on hand um it is it is a poverty stricken country it is a poor country um, you know, I think there are some some improvements being made. A big job thing now is call centers for the U.S. Uh, that have set up shop down there, and that's providing a, a lot of jobs. Um, the other thing too is that you know, for gang members that that want to get out of the gang life and go into normal normal society, it's really hard to get a job. There's a big stigma attached to it, and uh, I you feel know, like they, that's they, with America too. Even if like you go to jail for a few years, once you're out, it's hard to get a job. Right, right, right. So, I mean, there especially, it's especially it's yeah, already yeah. a country with 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 uh, with uh, an economy that's suffering, and it's hard to get a job there. So, imagine if you're a gang member. So, there have been some programs set up to help them uh, acclimate. You know, there's a bunch of NGOs doing really good work to help them get jobs and 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 help them, you know, get a get get onto sort of a level playing field. A lot of a lot of ex gang member organizations too. They set up bakeries or sort of like a, I think there was like a weaving one or t-shirt factories, things like that. But, you yeah, know, it's a, it's a struggling country. It's a struggling economy. Central America itself, um, I think, besides Costa Rica, is, is not doing great, and there's a lot of poverty there. And, of course, you know, poverty breeds violence, and poverty breeds um, opportunity for, for gangs like this. So, like I said, um, like, America is hard to get a job out of prison. Over there, that must be, like, that times 10, because, again, like, being a gang member, all that stuff. How do you, if you're in a gang, how do you even, uh, how do you get out of it? Like, say you're in MS-13. Can I just walk up to the boss and say, "Hey, I'm, I'm done"? No, no. I mean, it doesn't. You know, they say there's only there's only uh, two ways out of the the gang, which is jail or or dying. And even in jail, you've got to maintain your your sort of gang um your your gang uh, allegiances. But there is one tried and true method, and I've actually made a documentary about this, which is the evangelical church, which has been steadily rising in in El Salvador for about 30 or 40 years. They're very religious if, over there? Very religious. It's a, it's a very religious country. Uh, if you dedicate yourself to the evangelical church, to, to Jesus Christ and all that, if you sort of take on that as your as your new identity, then the gangs are likely to let you leave. But it is not a easy thing to do. And you have to really show that you're dedicated. So if you say, okay, I'm a born again Christian, I want out of the gang and they let you out. And, you know, they're going to keep an eye on you. And if someone sees you out late at night, maybe you're at a bar, maybe you're smoking weed, maybe you're hitting on women. Um, there's going to be consequences. And that they, 
they could end with you being killed. So the only real like tried and true method of leaving the gang and retiring is joining the church, is becoming a born again Christian. It's not a get out of well, for lack of a better term, it's not a get out of jail free card for for dealing with the gangs. Um, but it does work for a lot of gang members. And then there is the issue of law enforcement too, who just a lot of the times they just don't believe these guys. They say once a gang member, always a gang member. So sometimes they're targeted by law enforcement as well. Uh, and it's it's a tough road to walk. But uh, it is it is like the one of the only methods of getting out of the gang is that. Why is that? Are like the gang members themselves just? I mean, like yeah, like you said before, they're very religious. But what about being a reborn again Christian makes them say, "Oh, okay, then you're free to leave now." You know, I I I looked into this as well. There's there's no simple reason for it. Um, El Salvador has always been a, a very religious con- country, um, more so Catholicism decades decades and decades ago. But um, I think the gangs just sort of have respect for the church in, in a weird way. Not a ton of respect, you know, but they do have respect for for the church and respect for um for these sort of groups uh in, in a way and you kind of see that too you know in, in in even in mexico with the cartels you have some very religious members who have their saints that they pray to and their priests that they talk to uh even in the italian mafia right they were mm-hmm. so it wasn't like again it's not a get eligible free card you don't get to do whatever you want if you're in the church but there is this level of respect they have for the church as an institution. You know, in the poor neighborhoods, there really are only two institutions, which is the gangs and the churches, and that's it. So, you know, it's kind of like, uh, okay, we're gonna we're gonna give you guys some space to operate and some space to do your thing. Um, I think a lot of gang members too grow up with the church sort of helping them out in a way, helping out their families. Uh, so there, there's, this, there's just this level of respect there that I, I can't point to a single reason. Um, but it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very strange phenomenon. Yeah, that surprised me too, because I was watching a documentary and the churches, like the um the priests will go to the well, yeah, like they start recruiting kids at like 14 years old, like very young, but to join the gang members. So like the priests will go up to these kids or even the members themselves in the gang and try to convert them. And it sort of seems like if if I'm a gang member, I wouldn't want them talking, I wouldn't want my members talking to the church. I want them to stay in my gang. Even younger than that, sometimes, I mean, the kids that start out are like nine and 10 years old. And I think, yeah, that's the documentary I made for The Guardian. Um, I believe it was called, let me just look it up real quick. What was it called? No Way Out? Yeah, that was that was a, a, a documentary that I directed and produced. The only way out of MS-13. Uh, yeah, look. So not for 18th Street, only MS-13? Well, I, I mean, MS-13 gets more attention than 18th Street. But it, uh, the, the documentary itself, 18th Street and MS-13, it focuses on both. Um yeah, look, the, the the church can get away with a lot, but they also have to know not to push it. You know, you'll see they tread the line and they know not to get too out of pocket. So they have to be careful themselves. Like I said, they, they, they don't get to operate with impunity. You know, there are consequences if they get a little far ahead of themselves, if they get a little too aggressive. But there's no other organization or world where they would be allowed that, would, that you know, or group that would be allowed to operate like the church does. They are allowed to sort of talk to the gang members and things like that. They just can't get too aggressive. I mean, it's crazy. You have some some prisons now in El Salvador where you have like hundreds, if not thousands, of converted gang members. Look, are these gang members all telling the truth? I have no idea. I highly doubt it. Um, but it is it is a really popular phenomenon. Uh, are they all, you know, true believers in their hearts? Are they all going to stay the path? I, I again, I doubt it. Gang uh, gang members that convert get a lot of more privileges in prison than the ones who don't but it is it is i mean you'll see in the documentary you open up in a in a in a prison that has you know dozens if not hundreds of ms-13 members that are praying uh feverishly and uh yeah it, it's a really interesting phenomenon yeah definitely like it's tempting to just say that and then uh because say you're a born-again christian to get the benefits but i could also see like fake it till you make it like they fake it but then as they do it, it could be an incentive to actually turn the life around. So right, it's got, right. I think it's I, pros and cons. Yeah, I, I definitely think a, a few of them, you know, even if they are dedicated and showing it, maybe they aren't true believers, but they see it as a way out. And there's also some, there's a, quite a few that I met that really are um, true believers. You know, one of the one of the foremost experts in the world on, on, on these gangs is this guy, Stephen Dudley, who works for Inside Crime. He just had a book out about MS-13. That's fantastic. And his, you know, he really talks about how the gangs themselves are are almost like a family structure. 
you know, uh, because a lot of these kids come from broken homes. They don't really have anything. And they glom on to these groups as, as a family structure. And the church is successful because they operate in the same way. You know, both gangs and churches talk about, you know, your brothers. And, Very welcoming, uh, like come join the right, family and have right. what you and want. There's a, high, there's a hierarchy, there's traditions, there's rules. So it, it, there are, it sounds funny to say, but there are some similarities in these in these situations. So it's yeah. sort of like, a, I feel like almost a natural progression in a way. Like natural progression, like if you're a kid there, it sort of just makes sense to then join the gang. It's sort of. No, no, I mean, natural progression, I guess that was the wrong term. I mean, like, you know, if you want to get out of the gang, the church provides some of the same same things that the gang does, right? Which is this sort of family structure, these codes and rules. Obviously, the rules are very different in the church and the gang, but, you know, they're, they're, structurally, there are some similarities there. It provides you with brothers. It provides you with people who look out for you and, and things like that. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, no, I see that. Yeah, I'm obviously, I'm not drawing you know, a comparison in, in any way between like how the church operates and how the gang operates. You know, I'm just saying it's the same of welcoming sort of, right. Like right, here's exactly. your family. You have a family here, family here. They're very yin and yang, but they're the same. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And also like, fam- like kids and stuff. You said nine years old earlier. Like, I mean, I, I didn't know what I want to do with the rest of my life when I was 16, hell, even 18, like, but then nine years old, you're getting recruited to join this MS 13, like, gang of el salvador yeah man it's brutal i mean I, look i don't want to know what i want to do in my life right now uh yeah. but these kids there aren't a lot of options you know they're heavily in the neighborhood they know if you get to them when they're young they are going to join up and become loyal members and they don't i mean they don't start out right away you know holding machetes and doing all this but maybe they start out as lookouts you know um yeah, like just in this window, the neighborhood, keep an eye out yeah, sure nobody crosses. Letting, right or just walking around the neighborhood letting people know and um 9, 10, 11, like they're, 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 uh, they're very easy prey for gangs to recruit. So that's, that's generally when they, when they really start looking at people. I saw, um, well, also can't swear for the radio, but in your podcast, you said, uh, you like walked away from a church and a kid came up to you and said, uh, those gang members will like blank you up or something like that. Right. That was, that was the, the situation, uh, that I, that I talked about earlier. Um, when we had uh we were down there for that sort of health fair and sort of walked walked away a little bit out of the uh vicinity of, of what was going on and that those kids kind of like came up and gave us a warning and those kids were probably like a new recruit that joined and that's one of those like first i don't even here. know i don't even know if they were new recruits they might have even been a little too young but they were just kind of delivering a message you know they're they're hanging out in the neighborhood the gang members sort of uh told them they like, go give these guys a message you know i mean that could be like this sort of intro to getting further involved with them and that's maybe how it starts but i i don't even think they might have even been too young for the gangs to really recruit i mean i want to say that's good but at the same time <laughs> it's not good <laughs> yeah uh, so yeah while you're in el salvador what kind of uh what kind of people did you meet like did you meet the gang members themselves you said you met the pastor for your uh, documentary yeah i met a couple pastors a couple of um born again gang members um, I've definitely interviewed a couple active gang members. They're they're really hard to talk to sometimes, and they're not the most uh, not the most easy to get a hold of. You know, police officers, a lot of civilians that are just kind of caught in the middle. You know, I um, spent some time with a guy who's like a crab fisherman living, you know, in a in in a really poor area of El Salvador, deep in the countryside in the swamps, and he's dealing with the gangs trying to recruit his sons and threatening him and that sort of stuff. Um, politicians that are trying to find a way out. Uh, or or trying to manage their communities, just uh, everyone you could really think of, and a bunch of reporters from El Salvador who do amazing work. Threatening that uh, person you said, like the kid has to join, like he doesn't have a choice. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that is uh, some kids um, are are forced to join. You know, they're kind of just like uh, pressed really hard. Like, okay, you can join us or you can die, and that's why a lot of you know you see a lot of. Um, we had a big thing with, with unaccompanied minors from Central America that were coming to the U.S. border and trying to get into the country uh, from Sa- El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And a lot of them are fleeing gang violence. Either they become a target or they've been given no option, either join or die. So that those, I mean, those are their options. Flee the country, join the gang, or get killed. This is a different topic, like politically in America, but a lot of people are worried about people crossing the border, coming to America, bringing gang violence and stuff. Should we accept people so they can escape from 
the gang members they're running from, or should we not to keep away the violence from coming into America? I mean, I definitely think we should accept these kids. You know, they're El Salvador is undergoing it, it's a war. You know, it, uh, you might want to call it uh, you can call it whatever you want, but but it's got a death rate that's equal to a war. And the I think our I government stat over here actually, it's um. 6,600 murders in 2015, murder rate five times Chicago. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's very brutal. Things have calmed down a lot in the last year or two, which, which is great. But, like, you know, it, 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 it is a war. Um, we have played a role. Our government has played a role in, uh, in what the country is going through right now. And I think we have a duty to accept these kids that are coming here. Um, look, our vetting process for getting into this country is extremely thorough and extremely hard. Uh, I'm not going to pretend like there haven't been a couple of gang members who have snuck through, of course, you know, but we're talking about a couple dozen uh, out of like tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that have come here and tried to get through. Uh, I, yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you like even one life lost in the U S due to a gang member committing an act of violence is, is too much. Right. So I, I don't think it's a, it's, it's, you know, it's not easy. For, for me to say this, but I do think we have a duty to let these kids through. Um, you know, they they wouldn't be coming here if they had any other option. And our country has always served as a a place to a refuge for people that were fleeing violence, that were fleeing wars. Uh, in some years, we've done better than others. In some situations, we've done better than others. You know, I had family that came here as refugees. I don't feel comfortable. And people said the same thing about you know those people when they were coming here. It's always the case when you have refugees coming here from wars. Oh, they're violent. They're bringing this. They're bringing that. And I'm not going to sit and pretend that that there haven't been refugees that have came here, um, and committed, you know, acts of violence. But there's way more acts of violence committed by people that live here by American-born citizens. You know, uh, yeah. the 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 percentage is way way lower in terms of immigrants and and refugees that have come here com- compared to American-born citizens. We have these gangs here because we created them in the first place. So I don't think it's fair to turn desperate children away during these times it was the science versus podcast i haven't heard it in a while but about a year ago i had a painting job and why paint i listened to podcasts and i listened to a topic on immigration and yeah like a lot of the immigrants that come across the border the crime rate is actually much lower than your average american and it boosts the economy however again you have to factor in like you said it's not everybody's perfect some people will commit crimes but yeah, like it has to do the crime rates lower because if you get caught as a legal immigrant coming across the border or even a new one coming in, you're afraid to commit a crime. You don't want to get deported again. You don't want to get caught. You don't want to get in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's just no look. Some of these guys come here and do commit crimes. Again, I'm not going to pretend that that isn't the case. Uh, and there's been all these rumor like stories about the gang sending tons of people up here. No. Have the gang sent a few people out here to try to figure stuff out? Yeah, they have. Uh, I think most of them end up getting turned back. Um, it is it is hard to get get here. It is not easy. Our vetting system is not easy. It is very thorough, and people get sent back all the time that don't deserve to get sent back. But there's no like mass influx, mass invasion of gang members coming from El Salvador. It's just not the case. It's not true. Uh, and there's, you know, we're turning away a lot of people. Where we're, 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 I mean, we're indirectly sentencing, sentencing them to death. You know, they're getting turned back and they're, I, you know, I had a guy, uh, this is a bit more of a complicated case because he was at one time a gang member, but he turned state's evidence against his gang in El Salvador. He testified against them. And then he had both MS-13, 18th Street, and police who wanted to kill him. He came to the U.S. and we sent him back. We said, there's a credible threat against him, but it's not enough. And uh, we're going to send him back to El Salvador. And I, I caught him at intake in El Salvador for when he was going to be released back out into the street. And he was like, I'm not going to survive a week. And he probably wasn't. Yeah. I would not expect him to last long. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, um, it's not, it's not an easy situation. I'm not claiming to have any, any sort of um, cure all for it, but uh, it's, it's just brutal. And I, I just don't think we should be sending all these kids back to these untenable situations. How's this different than back in like the 1970s when they had the Civil War and a bunch of immigrants came in? I mean, I can't, I can't tell you. Uh, I, I don't know the specifics of that. I mean, I do know that, that, that from everything I've read, it really seemed like it was a lot easier to come to this country um, from Central America and from Mexico in the 70s. Immigration was not as 
heavily aggressively politicized as it is now there wasn't i think the amount of uh you know i, I feel like i've seen speeches from i think either the, uh, the first george bush uh where he talked about you know letting immigrants in and and, and um and the right way to do things, obviously, you know, there, it was still wasn't easy, but I think it was a lot less aggressive in that. There's also different classifications, right? If you're fleeing an actual war, um, the asylum process is much different than you're just fleeing from a country uh, that has profound violence that isn't classified as a war. You know, there, there's all sorts of conventions and rules that apply to these different classifications. Yeah, okay, I can see that. that definitely makes sense. All right, bring it back to El Salvador. So, like I said before, I did a podcast with the Colombia cartel as a topic, and what was mentioned that I found interesting was when the cartel comes to town, or when cocaine, uh, when cocaine comes to town, and like farmers start making cocaine, they uh, make a bunch of money for the first few years because, like, oh, look at all the money they make selling it. But then slowly, sort of inflation kicks in along with the cartel because they hear about cocaine, so they come in, and it sort of just corrupts the place or it kind of ruins the town and what it had so is every town in el salvador under ms-13 or if ms-13 comes to the town what what does that look like no 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 every town is not under ms-13 or 18th street you know there are plenty of of towns that uh that that don't have a presence but they've spread out a lot through the countryside that was a big thing five or six years ago was the gangs being like okay the cities are heavily policed why don't we expand and go into smaller areas um it's really tough i mean when you go to rural areas there there isn't a ton of law enforcement and these gangs can get in there and start pushing people around and really establish themselves and be like okay we're in charge now uh start extorting people you know start setting up shop and recruiting there are some crazy stories of villages in the north and the mountains that were these old sort of guerrilla strongholds back uh, strong, strongholds back in the day that had um you know these networks there of fighters uh 30 30 40 years ago and some of these networks still exist and some of these guys are still active so there are there are these like rumors of these these gangs that have tried to the gangs have tried to go set up shop there you know they sent like uh an emissary or one or a couple people to try to set up shop and these guys will kill them and just or, or force them out and be like you're not coming here so there are stories of that that exist but um yeah i mean it's like any gang spanning span territory you know they're going to try to set up shop where they're gonna be able to target people and sort of get away with whatever they can and it's 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 really sad because they'll set up they'll set up and they'll um you know these gangs too they're not they're not rich you know these aren't the cartels they're not bringing in billions of dollars they're not drug traffickers a lot of their money most of their money comes from extortion and extorting people who run like little little food stands or bus drivers or taxi drivers uh that's where their money like a dollar a day here two dollars a day there um, like a little tax on everybody. Right, right, right. They they call it the, the, the rent, La Renta. And, you know, <laughs> low-level drug dealing. And most of the members are living, like, hand-to-mouth. You know, they're not making a ton of money. There are some higher-ups that are, that are getting paid and doing okay. But even the higher-ups, they're not buying jets. You know, they're not buying yachts. They're not – they are nowhere near what the cartels are doing. Oh, okay, okay. And, um, yeah, like the gorillas you mentioned uh, up north and stuff. After the mm-hmm. Civil War, whatever uh, whatever happened to them or some of those other organizations? So some of them filmed, uh, you know, they they um, they formed political parties. The FMLN, which is one of the main uh, groups um, in on the left wing insurgency that was fighting, formed a political party. And uh, when I was down there in 2015, they were the party in power. Um, Are they, they the left wing? Left wing, right? Yeah, le- they were left wing group. They were okay. they were. They were, um, you know, they were the party in power, and they were actually, it was interesting because they, their whole thing was about uh, the governments targeting them back in, like, the 80s and cracking down on them, and they were the voice of the poor, and then they had a really strong anti-gang policy where they were targeting the gangs, and uh, you had some people saying, well, these guys used to be the voice of the poor, and now they're targeting the poor. Um, so it was sort of an interesting dynamic there, but yeah, so they, some of them formed political parties or got disarmed or, you know, things like that. They were like your uh, Robin Hood, but then they just start taking from the poor. Well, I don't know if they were consider- Rob. I mean, they were you know they were pretty brutal as well. Uh, but yeah, it was just it's 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 really interesting to see that that phenomenon and how it kind of works once they got in power. Are there any other uh, militia groups now? So like MS13 or 18th Street have everything on the. They have the towns on the wraps. They take money here and there from the people, or like they do their gang violence. Are there any uh, militia groups that they have to watch out for? Or- 
military not to have power well i mean there's there's military then i'll they have to work at work out for there's um i think there you know there are these death squads that are, are said to be made up of law enforcement whatever else but i guess i mean i think there's a few other gangs there there's definitely drug traffickers um that operate in in the country uh but i, I you know it, it's really dominated by 18th street and um they're stronger and, than the two uh, factions What's that? Well, dominated by eight, the two factions of, of 18th Street and MS-13. Like those are the gangs oh, okay. that are the most, um, most, uh, most powerful there. So yeah, there are there are a couple of of other gangs there that I've heard about, small gangs, um, drug trafficking gangs, things like that. But um, no, they're 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 by far the most dominant. Between like MS-13 and uh, 18th Street, well, you can't say they're having like their own modern day civil war in a sense, but for like the country, not just them. But what, uh, I guess, yeah, who's the stronger one or who uh, has more control? I don't know enough to really give a, uh, a, um, uh, a proper analysis. I mean, I think MS-13 is especially because 18th Street split into two factions. And those factions, you know, do battle with each other. I, I did a ride along with the police uh, back, it must have been 2015, 2017. And they were saying that gang that I was scanning them most at that time was, um, 18th Street revolutionaries because they were the ones that were really going to war with the police. But I think in terms of overall territory, it's probably MS-13. But again, I'm I'm, I'm not positive. I can't really give a fair assessment. Like you said, with the uh, 18th Street splitting up, that's gotta like kind of deteriorate them over time until like one of them takes power. So I, yeah, I mean, I they, guess they MS-13 like taking more over time, but yeah, they're definitely the most well known, and I think it's literally because of that National Geographic documentary. But 18th Street. Yeah, they split up years ago, though. I think it was more than a decade ago when they had their – maybe 15 years ago when oh, they so had their split. So, yeah, it's been a while since they since they split apart. Um, what was it, just like I'm political not, reasons? I honestly – I don't know. I mean, I think it was a clash uh, among leadership that, that, that led to it. But I, I – you know, I'm not, I'm not entirely certain. I heard, like, it's actually safer to be in a pure – MS-13 territory or 18th Street territory versus, like, there's gray areas where they're still fighting for, like, territory and land or something. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're in a heavily controlled area, well, you know, if you're in a heavily controlled area that's been, been a certain gang for a long time and they're not facing any threats on their borders, you know, it's actually relatively safe. It's dangerous when you're in a neighborhood that's being contested or when you're in a neighborhood that's controlled but also being pushed on in its border regions because you know there's a lot more violence there the gangs are a lot more on edge as opposed to an area they've controlled for a long amount of time and th that they're comfortable with yeah i can see that makes sense does that, does that make sense yeah, yeah no i definitely because there's a lot of like well game violence like shooting between the two and you don't want to get in the middle of there or something right something like that right right i'd assume same here if like you're between say a blood and crip uh violence or say this mafia versus this mafia yeah you... um I was gonna say 18th Street. I, I, I'm sorry, I just looked it up. They split in uh, in 2005. 2005. So yeah, 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I wonder why. But uh, yeah, I'm watching a uh, like. I mean, it's a whole different thing. But you've ever seen The Sopranos? Yes, of course. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Probably... I run a podcast on. I run a podcast on organized crime. Like I would expect all my listeners to stop listening if I hadn't seen The Sopranos multiple times. <laughs> Of course, of course. Yeah, it's like supposed to be one of the best TV shows of all time. I'm on the yeah. second season right now. And Wait, you yeah, just started? Yeah, I literally just started. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm envious of you for having just started, for like getting to see it for the first time. Oh, I'm excited. I just, um, w uh, what just happened? So one of the guys just got out of prison and ran over his old friend because he wouldn't see him in prison. So now he's uh, in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Ah, uh, yeah. About yeah. with the names, but yeah, so why... Um, why I say this, you already see a little bit of it, or I'm, I'm, I'm making a prediction. I could be wrong, but I'm expecting to see a lot of uh, sort of territory uh, bickering between the like uh, mafia, like New Jersey. I'm saying, oh, I want this land versus this mafia uh, gang. Yeah, I think with I think the Sopranos, it's more about projects that that bring money in and percentages and things like that. Those are very organized groups. Um, you know, MS13 and 18th Street are not organized, right? They're they're organized to a degree where they control their members very strictly in terms of like what you can and can't do and blah, blah, blah. But they don't have a really uniform system. They're not tapped into, you know, smart crimes where they're going to be making a ton of money. Drug traffickers usually won't even work with them because they're too unreliable and too anarchic and too prone to violence. 
Ooh, really? You know, so they're not, you know, they're, they're not, they're not adept at making money. Like they really, they really aren't uh, in terms of for the sort of control they have and the loyalty they inspire. They're, 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 you know, they're, they're a street gang and, and relatively um, out of control one at times. It's weird to say that because they do operate like a Stasi state in El Salvador and neighborhoods they control where they know everything that's going on and they're clued into exactly who's coming to the neighborhood, exactly what time. But at the same time, there, there's just chaos, you know? So even like El Salvador, they still have like a little more control, but they just, yeah, they don't have that hierarchy. They don't have that strict, this, that. They have a hierarchy. It's weird. It's weird. They have a hierarchy, but they're still prone to like chaos and anarchy in a way that isn't beneficial if you're trying to run a really organized crime organization that's that's trying to bring in a lot of money. Like in these America. guys, these Go guys ahead. aren't doing financial fraud, right? They're not tapped into credit card fraud. Like they're not making a ton of money that way. That's where the money is. Yeah. So they have their hierarchy. They give out the directions. They take their money from the people doing their taxes. But I guess, yeah, they just don't, they don't have that much control over themselves even. Yeah. 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 In, in a way, yes. In a way, it, it's hard to, you know, it's really hard to, um, to, to nail in terms of like how they, because everything, I mean, even people, even academics that have really studied the gang um, will tell you that like, you know, there's a lot of contradictions in, in exactly who they are and in what they do. And it's really hard to, uh, to nail down. You know, it's, it's, it's tough. It's tough to really explain. Cause I'm trying to tell you right now, like, yeah, they're, they're anarchy. They're, um, yeah, here's a quote from, uh, from inside crime, which is a fantastic, fantastic, uh, organization that covers crime in Latin America. The gangs have persisted for four decades without a master plan an all powerful leader or reliable source of income. The core membership consists of teenagers who communicate mostly via text message. Its principal communication strategies convey with spray paint. Its leaders are in jail. Most of its num members did not complete high school. And it's like they're unorganized and poor, but they're also firmly controlled. It's, it's very weird. It's hard so to... How are they still functioning? Like, like, I'd expect them to just fall apart by this point. I mean, they just keep growing, you know, and they have these clicks and they just keep expanding. And, uh, you know, you, you knock off the head and, and others rise. They're just really tough to shut down. Yeah, they're almost like too big to fail in a sense. Yeah. But then again, ancient Rome, they were huge, and that's what caused them to fall apart. I don't know. I don't – this is a whole, like – I don't know yeah, as much about it. I mean, I know. I, I know, but it's one of those things where it's still confusing to me and I think confusing to all the people that really study the game. Yeah, like text messaging. I heard uh, WhatsApp. That's a huge thing. And I heard, um, yeah, like that's how they primarily communicate with one another. Yeah. I mean, if you go into a neighborhood, there's – um. There's uh there's tons of uh they're, they're, like update all the updates are sent on WhatsApp. That's how they communicate. You know, it's like all the game members or some sort of text message thing. Um, that's how their messages are given out. That's their alert system and all that. You'll have like a lookout. He'll pull out his Android phone, send WhatsApp like, oh, a uh, cop over here on this street. Right. Or, Someone entering the neighborhood. There's lookouts everywhere. Stuff like that. Or higher up, sending messages through WhatsApp to like, uh, hey, look, let's start looking at this territory or something. But why WhatsApp? Is it just not easy to? I mean, WhatsApp's just just super popular, popular in these places. Yeah, they. I saw a stat where it's a uh, top ten uh, growing uh, industries or growing softwares for uh, millennials and a uh, Gen Z, the iGen, and I think WhatsApp was number. I want to say eight for millennials. I don't know. Somebody look that up. <laughs> and yeah, so um, speaking of like WhatsApp and it transforms, it makes it easy for them to communicate with everyone. I saw in prisons when the cell phone came around, they was it them or the Mexican gangs that were able to sort of control everything from prison? It was, it was, I mean, I, I think with all gangs, once cell phones got ubiquitous in prisons, it really changed the rules. That was something that I learned recently um, from Stephen Dudley's book that cell phones getting in prison, he talks about it through El Salvador, but I have to imagine it's with other, with other gangs as well, was a real game changer because it used to be really hard to send messages out of prison to dictate, you know, a lot of gang leadership is in prison to dictate what you wanted the people on the streets to do. And you have to imagine cell phones make all of that a lot easier. Was it like word of mouth or like letters? I think letters, word of mouth, all that. I mean, even now, That'd be you know, there's, there's, there's like super, super max prisons in the US where it's actually very hard to get a cell phone in, but I think they still communicate sometimes through. And, you know, I, I've heard like, you know, Aryan bro Brotherhood using, uh, secretive ink or hidden code things like that but um i think at some levels in those early days when cell phones became available in prisons and were able to be smuggled in it really changed things and made things a lot easier 
definitely. I mean, it just makes sense. <laughs> yeah. All right. So I think that's just about everything to cover for the MS-13 Street Gang. Is there uh, any final message or any final thing you want to get across on this topic? Not really. I think I think we covered um covered a lot of it. Uh, Sounds good. Then what a, about a final message for the audience? Yeah, I was going to say, if you're interested in more of this stuff, I mean, we've covered MS-13, Burmese drug lords, Russian mafia, all sorts of stuff at the Underworld Podcast. Um, just type Underworld Podcast, the Underworld Podcast, into any anywhere you listen to podcasts, and uh, you'll find it. Me and my co-host alternate each episode telling you about a, a different group. Uh, I find it fascinating. I hope you will, too. And uh, subscribe, give it a listen, give us five stars, and all that stuff. Sounds good. And yeah, for the listeners, you'll see a link to their podcast in the description. And again, Danny Gold, thank you for coming out. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. And for the audience, again, this is FM 91.7, WHUS Stores at the top of the hour. For more, find the links to find these episodes, find updates, go to podcasttheway.com. There you'll find social media, Twitter, Instagram. You'll just find whatever you need to find, podcasttheway.com. And as always, deuces.